Uh, with that, I invite Jeremy Apple up. He can introduce him. He knows more about what his life has entailed than me, so I'll let him introduce himself. Give him a warm welcome, please. Hi, everyone. It's uh, great to be here with you in sunny uh, southern Alberta. I was a reporter at the Medicine Hat News um, for a few years, 2017 to uh, 2020. And uh, something that always struck me about Southern Alberta was that it has this, this reputation that I, I think some of you are aware of, of being this very uh, white, conservative, uh, very religious, uh, backwater, and um, what 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 I learned when I lived in Southern Alberta is that while there's some truth to that, th there there's a lot more than meets the eye. There there it's a lot more diverse, both. Um, you know, like ethnically, but also ideologically, than its reputation uh, suggests. And I, I would argue that in that respect, Southern Alberta is a microcosm for Al Alberta writ large, right? It's changing. And um, I'm here today to uh, talk to you about someone who I think tried to uh, put the brakes on those changes. Um, Jason Kenney, who I, I, I hope you've all heard of, but maybe if there's anyone who's new to town. He was the premier for a few years. And uh, I think I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna start, I've written a book on Jason Kenney, uh, Kenneyism, Jason Kenney's uh, pursuit of power. And I think, I want to frame uh, the, the conversation we're having today around what's probably one of the more provocative uh, observations I make in the book. And that's, I don't think Jason Kenney's a hypocrite. This, uh, I, I see Shannon uh, shaking her head. That's, uh, oh, you, you agree with me? Okay, cool, we agree on something. That uh, doesn't always happen these days, but, um, I, but I think that will come as a surprise to a lot of people, this idea that, that Jason Kenney isn't a hypocrite. But I think there's a consistent ideological through line running throughout his career that makes many of his decisions in rhetoric, which appear inconsistent or hypocritical, to be anything but that. That's not to say that he hasn't engaged in hypocritical conduct throughout the course of his career. I mean, everyone's engaged in something hypocritical at some point. Um, you know, and, and this is especially evident early on in his career when I think he's less polished. Uh, like when he was the head of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Um, he invited himself to a budget hearing in Ottawa to encourage the federal liberals to cut spending, cut taxes, and uh, fundamentally alter uh, the role of government in the public sphere in the mid-90s. And he lambasted the government for wasteful spending and uh, needless perks for politicians, right? Like, what do these politicians need these uh, gold-plated pensions, he called them, right? And he, his agitation was actually the reason politicians in Alberta don't have pensions anymore. Ralph Klein took them away uh, after uh, shouting at Jason Kenney in uh, the cafeteria of the legislature. Um, but the thing with this is, uh, Kenny then asked for the government to uh, pay for the cost of his flight from Edmonton to speak at this committee, 
that he had invited himself to, to talk about how the government's spending too much money. Um, and he, he was like, no, 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 uh, the reform MP on uh, the committee, Ray, Ray Speaker, invited me. You, you can ask him. And then a reporter from the Canadian press did. And they said, well, invite is a strong word. Um, th those weren't their exact words, but that, th th he's like, well, he asked me if he could come, and I said yes. And so that, that's an example of hypocrisy, right? Here you have an idea, right, a, a, a sort of uh, stated principle, and a clear violation of that from the person stating it, right? That, now, now, that's hypocrisy. But... Um, I, I, I think there was a certain consistency in the decisions he made once he became an elected official, um, which were driven in almost equal parts by ideological inclination and electoral pragmatic consideration. I, I think he was quite masterful in striking a balance between the two. Um, in, so in order to understand what Kenny fundamentally believes, which is a, a big part of what I try to do in this book, I think uh, it's important to understand the undergirding philosophy of what's called the new right. And that, that would be the right of Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, the George Bushes, and to a lesser extent, Brian Mulroney, right? So when I'm talking about the new right, I'm not talking about the right of Donald Trump and Danielle Smith, although I would argue they're not all that different from the new right I'm talking about. But this is sort of what, um, what this, this, this sort of, I guess, revolution, if you will, in right-wing thought that occurred in late 70s, 80s, 90s, and uh, to today, which shattered the post-war progressive liberal consensus that favored a welfare state and having the state actually provide for people. And so when we talk about this new right, um, which I would say Kenny was one of the most effective emissaries of in Canada in, in, in my lifetime, um, there are two contradictory but complementary strains of thought that I think people often conflate confusingly. Um, those would be neoliberalism, the first of which, which I'm sure many of you here have, have, have heard of, this was the economic consensus that was ushered in in the late 70s and early 1980s that viewed markets as the solution to essentially everything, offloading what were previously state responsibilities, at least under the post-war consensus, onto individuals and other uh, private actors like families and civil society organizations. This view is uh, most famously summarized by Margaret Thatcher when she said, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, that there's no such thing as society, only individuals and their families. And the only appropriate function for government is to get the, out of their way and let them make their own decisions. These sorts of economic policies were what Kenny cheered on as leader of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation when they were implemented by Jean Chrétien's liberal federal government and Ralph Klein's conservative Alberta government, pushing them to always go further and cut deeper. He had quite some success uh, in that regard with Ralph Klein, but the liberals were, it, it was never far enough for him. Um, he was quite open at this time about his intention that I think you see when he returns to Alberta of using these attacks on, on, on government perks as a proxy for the entire social safety net. We saw that, of course, in the first year when he was premier. And he makes this big show of how he's cutting his own pay and MLA's pay. And then the New Democrats uh, put forward an amendment to ensure that this wouldn't be used as a pretext 
for uh, cuts to the social safety net. And of course, the UCP said no. No, I mean, it, they weren't trying to conceal the fact, really, that this was to warm the public up for um, this onslaught of austerity. Um, oh, lost my place. But there's a flip side to this neoliberal economic consensus, uh, a, a counterpoint of sorts which seeks to fill the void left in our social relations by the chaotic individualism and empty pursuit of profit embodied by neoliberal economics. That would be neoconservatism which is collectivist, where neoliberalism is individualist. It's nationalist, whereas neoliberalism is globalist in the original non-conspiratorial sense of the word. And it's statist, whereas neoliberalism is libertarian. So neoconservatives use the power of the state that remains after this sort of neoliberal offloading onto the private sector to lock, sort of lock into place the hierarchies unleashed by neoliberalism, giving them this higher moral uh, justification by evoking things like tradition and patriotism and uh, religion and sort of this general sense of Western chauvinism. It often manifests itself as uh, tough on crime uh, policies at home and unbridled uh, support for US militarism abroad, which is seen as a moral force to bring order to an inherently chaotic world. I've heard neoconservatism be re referred to elsewhere as neo-Victorianism, given the tendency for uh, some to conflate neoliberalism and neoconservatism, which is understandable because they often operate in tandem. And I think this alternate moniker reflects the static hierarchical vision of social order that neoconservative ideology promotes, where everybody knows their place in this pre-established social pecking order. But whatever you call it, there's a certain contradiction here. How does one obtain popular support for policies that are at their core elitist. It's done through what late British social theorist Stuart Hall called authoritarian populism. So authoritarian populists, and, and, and Hall was talking about Margaret Thatcher uh, in particular, and I think actually Jason Kenney would be quite flattered uh, by the comparison. Um, give shape to the sort of popular anger and discontent from people who are shut out of the political and economic order and claim to speak on behalf of the masses, the people. They present these policies as simply common sense, as uh, Pierre Polyev and Danielle Smith are doing right now, to manufacture this consensus in favor of measures that will only make the material conditions for all the lucky few worse. The ultimate goal here isn't the strengthening or weakening of the state or corporate power per se, but to uphold and strengthen existing power relations, locking them into place by whatever set of policies will do so. Which brings us back to Kenny and the question of hypocrisy. It might appear hypocritical for someone who spent their entire career expounding the virtues of free market capitalism to blow more than a billion dollars on a pipeline that was likely to get kiboshed. 
or spend millions of dollars on an energy war room and inquiry into this alleged uh, plot by foreign funded environmentalists to uh, pin uh, pin Alberta down in the words Kenny was fond of using. But it's not when you realize that the purpose in this case is to uphold fossil fuel industry hegemony. Then it doesn't, the, the free market is besides the point, right? It's about using the state to uphold and existing uh, institution of traditional power in Alberta. And you could say the same about uh, Kenny's tenure as the federal minister of citizenship and immigration between 2008 and 2013. It might appear hypocritical to fast track permanent resident status for immigrants who work in certain fields and have a certain level of education while vilifying refugee claimants as queue jumpers and bogus refugees. And there's no doubt an irony in calling asylum seekers queue jumpers when you're literally bringing people to the front of the queue based on uh, criteria of employability. But it's not. But it's, it, once you see Kennyism as an ideology dedicated to strengthening existing hierarchies and power structures, this disparate treatment of two categories of newcomers is fully consistent. The accepting approach Kenny took towards some classes of newcomers was conditional. Immigrants who can serve the corporate agenda and conform to a neoconservative vision of what it means to be Canadian will be invited into the country and find a warm welcome in the Conservative Party if they choose to be politically engaged. But if you're fleeing persecution and didn't have your papers in order, or a temporary foreign worker who's overstayed their welcome, you're deemed dispensable and dealt with harshly and targeted for swift deportation. In fact, I think one of the most sinister things Kenny did in his entire political career was in Hungary, where, where, where Roma people were fleeing persecution by a, an increasingly emboldened far right. He put up billboards in a village where a lot of Roma people live, telling them that if they want to come to Canada, they, got, they better be careful because if their claim isn't accepted, they will be deported quickly. And again, coming from someone who is a professed fiscal conservative would appear to be contradictory, but not when you realize the actuality, the, the purpose, the, the, his, his, the rhetoric of fiscal conservatism serves. Um, now in true authoritarian populist form, can he presented himself as the authentic voice of law abiding, hardworking immigrants, which he contrasted with a vilified image of asylum seekers. And Kenny was beloved among right-wing elements in immigrant communities, shuffling from cultural event to cultural event to make his presence known. Some in the Chinese Canadian community uh, referred to him as Smiling Buddha. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Kenny has always had a good sense of humor uh, about his weight in, in his defense. Um, Rishim Jaffer, who I interviewed uh, for the book as coffee shop in Edmonton on White Avenue, who was a caucus mate of Kenny's for a long time, uh, famously dubbed him the minister for curry in a hurry because of his habit of just hyper focusing on ethnocultural outreach. He didn't spend a lot of time in Calgary when he was a federal member of parliament where his riding was. Much of his time was spent in Ottawa and then the suburbs around Toronto and Vancouver where uh, these swing ridings are with large immigrant communities. which 
played a major role in giving the Harper government a majority in 2011. But the limits of this conditional acceptance were revealed in the 2015 federal election, when talk of things like barbaric cultural practices, which a phrase Kenny ensured was in Canada's new citizenship guide, right under a photo of a woman in a hijab, his efforts to ban niqabs from citizenship ceremonies, and scapegoating of refugee claimants crashed sharply with the reality of the Syrian refugee crisis of the day, which was immortally symbolized by the body of three-year-old Alan Kurdi washing up on the shores of Turkey after his family attempted to make their way to Canada. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was elected promising a kinder, gentler form of Canadian nationalism. And Trudeau did, to his slight credit, eliminate the worst excesses of Kenny's immigration and refugee policies, but he kept their basic structure intact. And I think this is fully on display when you look at how Canada's treated refugees fleeing Ukraine and Palestinians from Gaza. Canada rightfully opened its doors to an unlimited number of Ukrainian refugees with few, if any, restrictions in their time of most need. But now you see with Palestinians from Gaza who are being criminalized before they even arrive with paperwork that demands to know every single job they've had since they were 16. I can tell you every single job I've had since I was 16. I'm pretty young. I, 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 and to explain any injuries they've received before that information is sent to the Israelis, the very people that Palestinians from Gaza are fleeing to get the Israelis' approval for Canada to accept these refugees. It's unsurprising that under this framework, while we've let in thousands of Ukrainians, and justifiably so, not a single Palestinian from Gaza who applied to enter Canada has even had their paperwork processed by immigration, refugees, and citizenship Canada. But you also see this continuity with the continued uh, reliance on temporary foreign workers to uh, fulfill job needs in, in the Canadian market and their deportation when they overstay the terms of their employment, which ties them to a single employer. Now, back to Kenny. He could have remained in Ottawa and built up a following while waiting for Trudeau to lose his luster before launching a conservative leadership bid. If that sounds familiar, that's because it's precisely what Pierre Polyev did. Instead, Kenny took a gamble on returning to Alberta to unite the PCs in Wild Rose, finishing what uh, ironically, uh, finishing what Danielle Smith started in 2014 when she made the grave error of crossing the floor to the PCs en masse as leader of the Wild Rose Party. In the long run, Kenny's fateful decision to return to Alberta would be as grave an error. But it was in Alberta that the hollowness of Kenny's populist appeal did him in with the very base he riled up upon his return to Alberta in 2016, when he slapped on a cowboy hat and drove across rural Alberta in his big blue Dodge Ram, promising to take the fight to the very Ottawa elites he so perfectly embodied. Few, few actually bought this new image that he had cultivated himself, this rebranding. But most among the ranks of his base of supporters were willing to stomach these populist deficiencies as long as he could defeat the NDP, cut taxes, and ruffle some feathers in Ottawa. At first, everything went according to plan. This was the summer of repeal. 
in which he cut taxes, regulation, and downsized the public sector that in a way that would have made a younger Kenny quite proud. Enrollment in publicly funded but privately operated charter schools in increased, as they did under the NDP. He launched a campaign of state-sponsored harassment and intimidation against environmentalists. And he closed the busiest supervised consumption site in North America, right here in Lethbridge, right before the drug, cri drug poisoning crisis became the major threat to public health that is today. But then the pandemic happened. Kenny's approach was to do his utmost to ensure business kept functioning as usual to the extent he thought possible. He dithered constantly between depicting the pandemic as a collective threat on par with the Second World War and dismissing it as a mere influenza. He repeatedly resisted imposing restrictions before introducing convoluted restrictions that made little sense when it was too late for them to have a significant impact and fueled this conspiracism that the pandemic wasn't actually something we should take seriously. He assured anti-vaxxers that there would be no vaccine passport before introducing one in all but name after his plans for the best summer ever resulted in record intensive care admissions. The contradictions became insurmountable. It became clear to this rural UCP base who wanted no restrictions whatsoever that Kenny was using them to pad his resume, perhaps for an eventual return to Ottawa. The, uh, does anyone remember the grassroots guarantee? Yeah. yeah, that was the sole issue he campaigned on in the 2017 UCP leadership race, which by the way, is still under RCMP investigation. Seven years later, I, I had a very annoyed uh, RCMP K Division officer on the phone in the very late stages of writing this book because I wanted to make sure that they didn't just quietly drop it. And she said, no, don't worry. When, when, when there's uh, movement on the file, we'll issue a news release. Um, but the grassroots guarantee was a lie. Kenny had no intention of listening to his base when the base's will contrasted with this rigid, hierarchical, order that he envisioned. I mean, Jason Kenney loves institutions, right? He loves the crown, Westminster uh, parliamentary democracy, the Vatican. These are all very rigid, hierarchical institutions. But when he came back to Alberta, he unleashed forces who wanted to blow it all up. And he ultimately couldn't contain them, which leads directly to the situation we find ourselves in today. Now, thank you. I would be honored to uh, take any questions you might have. We are very much appreciative of LSCO for providing his venue free of charge. Uh, and we very much appreciate you um, helping them out by purchasing uh, your lunch here every Thursday. U of L is very much uh, a supporter of SACPA, has been for 56 years, and they give us uh, a little bit of money every year to help us uh, tie all the, the uh, you know, our expenses. And uh, we very much appreciate the expertise from professors at the university coming to speak at SACPA occasionally. So thank you very much to Lethbridge Herald and other media for coming out uh, constantly and reporting on the sessions. And lastly, but not leastly, uh, Ryan Craddock from uh, Rogers TV, who faithfully come here and report our sessions uh, and put them up on YouTube and uh, show them on the community television. 
So now it's time for questions. And I would have encouraged you to you know, not be so courteous that you want to always look the speaker in the eye. If you look in the, towards the camera, that would be more appropriate. And, and we will forgive you for not being courteous and looking people in the eye. And once you've asked your question, if you could return to your, to your seat, that would be as well. You can come up for seconds, but if you can return to your seat after you ask the question. And I think it would be working OK if we use a handheld uh, instead of moving the mic around all the time. So if you don't mind, just grab, the, grab a hold of the mic and. I have a quick question. OK. Can, you grab, can someone grab me a glass of water? Yes, I will, I will do that right now. Trade mics. Please and state just, your yeah. first and last name before asking your question. Yeah. Yeah. And I always do that. <laughs> Henning Mundel is my name, and now I'm going to be impolite. Great. <laughs> but I want to ask you the question, OK, so you've given us uh, quite a lot to think about in relation to Kenny and those of us who have sort of known a bit about him or more about him from the days be before he entered even federal politics and so on and all along. You made a little hint, but I want you to elaborate a bit more. Do you think he is going to try federal politics again? That is probably the question I've been asked the most. Um, I think I think he he wants to. If if that you don't think he does, Shannon, you know him better than I do. Well, you've met him more than once. Yeah, and you're still here, and he's gone. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, he, I mean, he made some mistakes for sure, but I, I, I think he, he believed, he bought his own hype. But anyway, sorry, I will answer your question. Um, I think that he wants to, I think, because I could tell you, I spoke with multiple people for the book who knew him when he was in high school, both said, he openly said, I want, either I want to be prime minister one day or I'm going to be prime minister one day. They couldn't remember which. But, there, but my point is that there is that naked ambition and that just, that doesn't go away, right? Once you've uh, been defeated. And again, he technically didn't lose. He's technically never lost an election since he ran for a VP position with the young liberals in the 1980s. It's the only time he lost an election. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think he's biding his time. I know, obviously, he doesn't want uh, to be uh, Boris Johnson, right? And uh, offer himself uh, for a comeback and everyone tell him to. Can I swear here? <laughs> All right. Well, you'll, you'll have to bleep that if. if um, but yeah, I mean, because I, he doesn't. And everyone I spoke to who actually knows him, not like knows him personally, uh, says that that this is a guy who politics is his life, right? And, and he does, you know, one thing I did learn that I, I, I was somewhat surprised to learn through the course of writing this book is he does have friends. <laughs> he does, he has people who will protect him who will tell some nosy reporter trying to write a uh, book about him to get lost. But these are all po mostly political friends, right? They're friends of his that he's sort of made on his political journey. So I, again, I think he wants to come back. Again, he, wouldn't, he didn't talk to me for the book. So I, this is pure speculation. But I, I, I think it's certainly something that he wants to do if it's feasible. But I don't think he would come back unless he knew he was going to win. And I don't, I, I think, uh, and, and to, to Shannon's point, I, 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 I think he's done in Alberta politics, right? Like the, the take back Alberta crowd 
and I'm, I'm not in sympathetic to the take back Alberta crowd uh, by any stretch, but they want nothing to do with him. They think he's Satan. So um, I, 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 but I mean, in terms of making a comeback in federal politics, if there's an opening in Calgary, um, I, I, I mean, I could see him a few years down the road making a comeback. Uh, but his, his original plan, actually, he, he admitted this in an interview. He did, October 2022. So Smith is elected UCP leader. He sits down with uh, Sean Spear, this conservative party hack who has an online news site called The Hub. And uh, he gets access to conservative politicians, of course. And uh, I, I, I thought that that interview was it was very interesting for a variety of reasons. I use it repeatedly in the book. But um, in this one, he freely admits, um, yeah, I, uh, in, in part of it, I think, was him sort of uh, seeking to maybe cut his losses. But he was saying, my, I, I didn't plan on being premier forever. He, 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 and of course, no, I'm, yeah, because mortality kicks in. But also, he didn't plan on being, he, like he, he said, his plan was to get reelected, stick around for a couple years, hand over the reins to someone else, and then leave. And he didn't say what he wanted to do after, but I think knowing what I know about him, that it was quite clear to me that he wanted to return to federal politics and maybe uh, one day be the prime minister. I don't think he can be prime minister. That, you know, I think there's too much baggage there. But I mean, I could see him being a cabinet minister for uh, Pierre Polyev if Polyev, um, you know, uh, runs for and wins a second term, say, or if there's a by-election opening. Like, I, I don't think we're done uh, with Jason Kenney yet. Um, and I kind of hope for the sales of my book that um, he'll at least try a comeback. I mean, that's the, that's the ideal scenario, right? He, he does the Boris Johnson thing and tries to mount a comeback and is just wildly rejected. That, that is my ideal scenario. But um, yeah, I, I wouldn't totally, I mean, Danielle Smith, of all people, launched a political comeback, right? And now Danielle has like a certain uh, appeal to her that I think Jason Kennedy lacks, like personally. You, you know what I mean? Like I think it's a lot easier for Danielle Smith. Like sh she doesn't have the whole neoconservative baggage. She doesn't care about institutions, the crown, the church, right? It's, her, her approach to politics, and I, I don't think she's governed that much differently from how Kenny would. But her, she, her politics are a lot more free-flowing, right? She's a libertarian, whatever that means. Um, and I think it's, so I think it's easier for her to admit fault, to, to say, yeah, I was wrong to cross the floor. I should have consulted with the party's grassroots. And I was trying to unite the right, but I failed, right? And so she was able to earn back those very people's good graces. But Kenny can't admit he's wrong, ever. You, you, if you listen to the few podcast appearances he's, he's done uh, since um, he left politics, he, he was never wrong, right? He never did anything wrong. Nothing is his fault. Everything is uh, a result of circumstances beyond his control. And... Um, yeah, now, now I'm just rambling, so uh, please, I don't want to take up, uh, I'll, I don't want to filibuster uh, questions. Thanks very much. My name is George Rigo. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Your book sounds like a real rollicking uh, foray through the left-wing conspiracy world, but that's just fine. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I do disagree with one of your points on Kenny being a representative of the... Uh, the Thatcher Reagan tradition of, uh, of of conservative thought, I would think that he's more of a, a Chesterton, you know, a, a social conservative thinker, which neither Thatcher nor nor Reagan were. But your book sounds like a lot of fun. Um, I can honestly say, in 1997, when I worked for a political party, 
we, uh, I was one of the guys that said, hey, let's get Jason Kenny and unleash him on the conservative world. So thanks very much and good luck with your book. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess that was more of a comment uh, than a question. But I would say that the the sort of uh, conservatism in the mold of G.K. Chesterton is, uh, you know, some foundational to the very um, doctrines of neoconservative thought, right? In that there is a huge social conservative element because there's a moral element to neoconservatism, right? And so not obviously not everyone who's a neoconservative is on the religious right, but the religious right is attracted to neoconservatism uh, for that very reason. Um, it, it, it fits with that ideology. But I would just say, like, uh, there's a great book, if you're interested in more, uh, you know, left-wing conspiracy theories, uh, there's a very great book called uh, The Reactionary Mind, uh, Conservatism from Edmund Burke to Donald Trump by Corey Robin. And he talks about how conservatism or um, is, from its inception, has always been a response to uh, sort of what conservatives regard as excessive, disorderly social change, and sort of how, in the main question of conservatism, regardless of what form, and there are lots of nuances and different types of conservatism, of course, like any political ideology, but it's always adapting its strategies to, in response to the, um, progressive agenda in social change that's happening too quickly and how to leave the most parts of the sort of old order intact, right? And so it's constantly evolving and taking different forms. And that's why I would say what Danielle Smith's doing isn't very different from what Jason Kenney's doing. Um, even though she comes from a very different type of conservatism than Jason Kenney. And I would say that even Donald Trump, I don't think, is all that different from uh, George W. Bush. Um, I mean, his tone is very different. But in terms of the substance, in terms of the actual policies that he was imposing, yeah, I, I mean, I don't see a huge difference. Um, there. But yeah, I think there's a broader conservative project that if you look in like a historical continuum, it's one of, okay, how do we best um, keep these traditional structures intact that are under attack by, um, you know, progressives, whether they're socialists or liberals to varying degrees. And um, that produces all different strands of uh, conservative thought. But I, I appreciate your uh, thoughtful comment. Hi, Ken Sears. Um, you almost, you sort of started to lead into my question a little bit ago about talking about Danielle Smith not being that much different. Um, but what, what I'm interested in is Jason Kenney came into, back into this province as a carpetbagger. He parachuted in and he managed to pull back together what was a really fragmented civil war going on on the old social credit, progressive conservative uh, population in this province, rural mostly. But he managed to pull them back together and then part of that came back and bit him very badly. Daniel Smith now comes along pulls and has an easier job pulling it back because Kenny had pulled them back to some proximity. But those tensions and those angers and those hatreds are still there. And so this, I guess I'm asking you to be a little bit of a crystal ball here. Who's going to bite Danielle Smith? Well, I think uh, David Parker has made it clear that if Danielle Smith doesn't um, operate as his, uh, you know, minaret, um, they'll jump ship and, and, and uh, form a new splinter party. So we'll have like another, you know, wild rose. Um, and I, I mean, I, like, I don't think Danielle Smith is very, uh, 
smart like intellectually though i do think that she is a very talented uh, uh broadcaster and communicator and um I, I i think she knows who's putting the bread on her butter and that's why you see her do all sorts of things that i think are outside of her comfort zone like this uh parental right this assault on on the very existence of transgender people that um she's launched and um and, and and other things too like again i think she's a lot more flexible a politician than kenny is because she doesn't have that like firm these firm convictions about order and established hierarchies and all that um but who do i think which like are you asking me to like um like name someone like someone in the UCP caucus? No, no, uh, well, it could be Nenshi. I mean, I think Nenshi could win. He could. Um, yeah, he asked me to do. Where in that conglomeration of warring interests, there's now Yeah, but I, I don't think she's going to, I mean, maybe at some point she's going to upset the take back Alberta people, but I mean, she's very close with them, pers right? Like she's buddies with David Parker. Like she went to his wedding to that uh, propagandist from uh, True North, um, right? Like they, they are friends. They, they are part of the same social circle. And again, I think, I think that Danielle Smith has this flexibility that is reminiscent of Ralph Klein, right? Where she'll go where the wind's blowing. And so if there's a more powerful countervailing force to take back Alberta that would push her in a different direction, I could see her doing that because I do think she fundamentally uh, wants to be liked. And I think that might be her weakness. Um, whereas Jason Kenney doesn't really care, I don't think, about being liked because he's better than everyone. Um, which I, I realize doesn't directly answer your question, but I hope that it was the sort of thing you were looking for. Who will bring her down, though? Uh, who will bring Danielle Smith down? Oh, man. I, predictions, I always... See, the thing about making predictions is I always look like a complete jackass when they don't come to fruition. Uh, you know, I didn't think Russia would invade Ukraine, and they did, and I uh, wrote some things that have aged pretty poorly in the lead up to that, but um, I, I don't know. I do see Smith probably being in power for a while, and I know, I think some people here uh, are glad to hear that, and I think a lot of people here aren't, um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I, she has a personal appeal that, and, and again, I don't agree with anything she believes, but I've, you know, I've met her a couple of times, and just, she has a way of talking to people that is really, like, inviting and very, uh, she's very good at saying the most unhinged things in the most calm, rational tone, and just having a conversation, right? Like, okay, that's your opinion, that's very interesting, here's what I'm saying, right? And so... I mean, I think she'll probably be in power um, a while. Um, but if we're looking uh, at the NDP, if we're looking at the current crop of, of, of candidates and rumored candidates, I think Nenshi could do it. I mean, he is very experienced in winning. So, and then she's a rumored candidate. He's, but he, it's a rumor I think was started by him. So, uh, I think he might have some legs there. He might have some legs. But um, obviously, with the NDP leadership race, this, these whole other existential questions come up about what is the NDP, what does it stand for now in like a post-Notley era. 
Um, and you, you have Sarah Hoffman, who would be my personal pick for leader of the crop, because she's the one who's saying that we should be talking about climate change, we should be talking about strengthening public health care, we should be talking about uh, health, climate, what's the third part? How, oh, and housing. I mean, housing, I mean, this is such a big issue, right? Like, I don't, maybe not as bad in Lethbridge as is in Calgary or Edmonton, but I mean, I'm never going to be, like, I'm from Toronto, right, originally, and I would like to move back there at some point in the future. I'm never going to be able to afford a house in Toronto. Like, it's not possible. Um, uh, and, uh, the, but again, you see in Calgary and Edmonton, that is also a, a really uh, significant housing issue. Um, I don't think Hoffman is necessarily the person to do that. But that, that would be my preferred approach of the NDP, having this sort of bold, um, um, uh, what would be characterized as left-wing approach, but isn't necessarily um, articulated in that way, and is articulated like the right is so getting good at doing as popular common sense. Um, but if we're talking about people who want to continue sort of the NDP's more centrist drift, which is clearly the approach Kathleen Ganley is taking, um, I think Nenshi honestly is the person to do that because he doesn't have partisan baggage. Um, and he was able to win elections in Calgary repeatedly running roughshod over his conservative opponents, and I'm talking too much, I'm sorry. Uh, please, please come to the mic if you want to ask questions. And uh, on, an, on a note about affording to live in Toronto, if you sell enough books here to, today, <laughs> you might actually be able to move to Toronto. Everyone here buys a book? Yeah. I will start my Toronto uh, okay. housing <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, I'm Ian Hurdle. Um, I actually have two questions, and I sort of wonder where he is. I keep thinking, where is Carmen San Diego? Where's Jason Kenny now? And the second one is, he had an experience when he was at a private Catholic university in San Francisco, and he didn't complete his degree, and he had a large fight against a bunch of uh, women lawyer students. Yep. And I wonder, if that fight sort of scarred his viewpoint quite strongly for his life. That was my question. Where is he now? Okay, well, I'll answer the first question uh, first. Uh, he is uh, serving as an advisor to the law firm Bennett Jones, which is interesting because he's not a lawyer. Don't know how much actual work he does there. Um, he sits on the board of the C.D. Howe Institute, because I guess uh, there were no openings at the Fraser Institute at the time. Um, you know, he sits on the board of, uh, I believe, ATCO, the, the, the power company, right? He's doing a typical post-political career uh, trajectory of just sitting on boards and, and keeping a low profile. Um, you know, he pops up every now and then to do uh, interviews on sympathetic shows where he's not going to uh, be asked any tough questions or uh, expected to take responsibility for his uh, decisions. Uh, so that's what he's up to uh, these days. Not much. Um, in terms of his time in San Francisco, um, I mean, I do think that was around the time that his, his worldview was definitely solidified. And you saw that with the sort of unique zeal with which he approached uh, his activism there. And uh, I think throughout his political career, he learned to channel it in different directions based on sort of the things that he could get away with politically, right? So abortion, you know, he's passionately against abortion, right? And he remains to this day, but it became clear, I think, especially when Stockwell Day floundered as the alliance leader and Harper took the helm and Kenny supported Stockwell Day in that um, leadership race. Um, so him and Harper kind of, there was some uh, coldness between them for a bit, but 
it became clear that social conservative issues in, in, in Canada are just not going to win you elections. They'll win you uh, certain constituencies, but they aren't enough to appeal to a broad electorate. So we put those on the back burner. Right, and focused on economic issues, on immigration, on foreign policy that are still part of this, you know, sort of neoconservative worldview. Um, but um, yeah, he learned to pick his battles over the years. But I think a big thing, because interestingly, he he, I mean, he worked for Ralph Goodale in the summer of 1988 when he was home from San Francisco. Uh, so he was working through, I think, these, these sort of political tensions um, that you really see um, sort of resolve themselves somewhat when he converts to Catholicism around 1989. And he actually, right, because he was a liberal originally, which I alluded to in my remarks, earlier remarks. But um, um, interestingly, he claims that when he went to the University of San Francisco, he had a roommate who subscribed to National Review, this neoconservative uh, publication. Um, and he said that when he was like this standard sort of Canadian uh, protectionist, uh, sort of multilateralist liberal, and when his roommate was out, he described reading uh, his National Review articles, rifling through them like they were Playboy, um, which I thought was funny. Um, but but uh, yeah, you know, it's funny. A lot of people, I think, when they go to university, they um, become more progressive. Or at least that's what um, people like Kenny now, when he's going around and speaking on these podcasts, would like you to believe. But it was there that he became ultra conservative. And then through engaging in electoral politics, he sort of learned to pick his battles. Any other questions? Oh, is it? Okay. Uh, uh, time is up, but I have a final uh, question. Uh, uh, actually, if you can give us something to walk with, Jeremy, for with the, considering the experience we've had with Kenny, that would be great. I uh, just mentioned um, next week we talk about Rachel Notley's legacy um, and what comes after Rachel. Trevor Harrison from the University of Lethbridge is coming to give his thought on that. So with that, uh, thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, give us some final thoughts. <laughs> Um, I think uh, Jason Kenney was a very skilled politician who was able to really shift the entire political discourse in Canada increasingly closer in his favored direction. But to do so, he, um, he had to appeal to forces that he actually had nothing but disdain for. Right, and, and I think the reason Jason Kenney failed, there are lots of reasons, but the, the, the chief one among them is that he had nothing but disdain for his own supporters. He thought they were a bunch of idiots. And uh, in, in that sense, I think the story of Jason Kenney, regardless of whether you agree with his politics or, or not, is, is, is a cautionary tale of, of, of political hubris. And I guess that is the uh, takeaway I would leave you with.